Okay, perfect. Thank you. No worries. All right. My name is Catherine Hayhoe, and I am a climate scientist. Now, one of the biggest questions I'm often asked is, why does climate matter anyways? Because when we look at the weather from day to day, week to week, and even year to year, it kind of looks like this, a really big squiggly line where we get hot and cold and wet and dry. And for example, if you live in the Midwest United States, over the past week, you've seen temperature swings of over 70 to 80 degrees from day to day. It goes from, you know, minus 20 to plus 50 and even bigger than that. So why does climate matter? Well, climate is the long-term average of weather over at least 20 to 30 years. And what we often don't realize is that climate is actually very stable. So the weather can go up and down. Like I said, you know, it can be cold or hot or wet or dry. We can have snow or rain. But over 20 to 30 years, it all averages out. So weather is kind of like a single tree. It's what happens in a certain place at a certain time. And weather is what sticks in our heads. We remember weather because we all have, you know, a weather story of that crazy hot day or that incredible cold when they closed the schools. You couldn't even go outside or if you throw water in the air, it would freeze. That's weather. Climate is like a forest. It's the long term average of weather over at least 20 to 30 years. So why does climate change matter then? A geographer back in the early 1900s defined climate as what we get, what we expect on average, whereas weather is what we actually get. And what I would say is climate is what we plan for in the future and weather is what we remember from the past. Why does climate matter? Climate matters because we actually use it in all kinds of different ways that you've probably never even thought about. Where do we get our building codes from for our homes? How do we know how big of an air conditioner or a furnace we need or we don't need? What type of crops do we grow in what part of the country and how do we grow them and when? How do we determine our flood zones? How do you know if your house or your school is in a flood zone or not? What type of clothes do you have in your closet? Do you have a big winter coat and boots or not? And then people use climate for other information like water plans and stuff like that, looking way out into the future to make sure that we're gonna have the water that we need. So climate actually plays into our lives in a lot of different ways. The type of crops that we see growing in fields outside the cities where we live, um, even the plants and trees we have in our garden, what type of animals and birds and insects we're used to seeing, how our homes are designed, and like I said, even the clothes that we have in our closet depend on climate. Just because there's one hot day in the summer doesn't mean you don't need a winter coat and boots if you live in the north, right? So here's why climate matters. Climate matters because when we plan for the future, whether it's making sure that we have enough food or water or energy or that our roads or our buildings are built to withstand whatever conditions they're going to see in the future, it's like driving down a road looking in the rear view mirror. We have a lot of very straight roads in Texas. This is actually a picture of where I live in Lubbock, Texas. And there are some roads that are so straight that you could be driving down the road, not just staying in the road, but in your own lane, looking in the rearview mirror. Why? Because the road is so straight that where you were five minutes, 10 minutes ago, it's a perfect predictor of where you'll be in the future. But just before you get to the top of this map, there's a giant curve in the road. And if you're driving down the road looking backwards at where you've been, and you hit this curve, you're going to run off the road. So in the same way, planning for the future based on the past is like driving down the road looking in a rearview mirror. It works great if climate is stable. But if climate is changing, we cannot only look backwards. We have to look forwards, too, to be prepared for that curve in the road. That's why climate change matters. Because we're used to this variability up and down, that's weather. And we know that long term, over much of the course of human civilization, not just our lifetimes, but thousands of years, climate has been pretty stable. But what happens if it's no longer stable? And even worse, what happens if the variability is changing? So why do we care about a changing climate? The first reason is we care about it because it's altering or changing future conditions that affect 
things that matter to us. It affects how we build our homes and our roads, what, how much water we have available to us, how much energy we need. It even affects our health and more. But again, what happens if it isn't just a change in climate? What happens if the variability is increasing too? Well, then we care about it because it's changing the risk of disasters. So this is a really interesting map. It's a map of the number of weather and climate disasters that have caused at least a billion dollars worth of damage since 1980. So what are weather and climate disasters? Well, one of them might be you know, a hurricane or a drought or a really crazy heat wave or heavy rainfall and flooding, severe storms, hail, tornadoes, all of those are weather or climate disasters. What is not a weather or a climate disaster? An earthquake, that's a geologic disaster. A volcanic eruption, also a geologic disaster. So this is only weather and climate, and we know that we're already naturally at risk from these extremes, right? Because sometimes we get crazy weather, that's just normal and natural. Why does climate change matter when we already get these crazy events? It matters because what it's doing is it's exacerbating these risks. In other words, it's making them worse. The way I like to think about it is by looking at a pair of dice. We always have a chance of rolling a double six naturally. A double six could be that crazy hurricane or the record-breaking wildfire or a heat wave in the summer. Those double sixes happen naturally. But what's happening as climate changes is decade by decade, it's sneaking in and it's replacing one of those other numbers with a six. So all of a sudden we're rolling more and more double sixes and we're like, this isn't normal. We're not used to rolling this many double sixes. It's kind of like a baseball player who was already a good baseball player but then he starts taking steroids. And then before you know it, he's hitting twice the number of home runs that he used to. You might say, okay, well, you know, was the home run on July 2nd, was that one a natural one? And the one on July 8th, that one was a steroid one. You can't tell the difference because they look the same. But we know when we look at the statistics over the whole season, that something has definitely changed. And that's exactly what we see happening with our weather and climate disasters today. Before we get into talking about specific types of things that are changing and how they're affecting us, I want to back up a minute and say, well, how do we even know that climate is changing in the first place, right? Because you might have heard this or you might have even thought this the last few weeks since it is winter, a lot of people say, well, it's freezing out. How can you say the entire planet is warming when it's record cold where I live? Well, did you know that in 2017, I don't have the numbers for 2018 memorized yet, but I will. But in 2017, across the United States, cold temperature records were broken at over 10,000 different weather stations. You might say 10,000 cold temperature records. Well, how can you say that it's getting warmer? That's because we broke over 35,000 high temperature records the same year. So we still have variability. That's just our natural variability. We can still break cold records and hot temperature records. But as climate is changing, we are breaking many more high temperature records than low temperature records. That's what climate change is doing to us. And we know that when we track global temperature measured by thousands of thermometers all around the world, assembled by all kinds of different organizations like NASA, the Japanese Meteorological Agency, the Met Office in the United Kingdom, when we track global temperature, we can see that, sure, it goes up and down from year to year, absolutely. But decade by decade by decade, it is getting warmer. And now it's at the point where 16 out of the 17 warmest years on record have all occurred just in the last 17 years. Why do we care about this? Because it's taking these risks that we always face naturally, like floods and droughts, hurricanes and heat waves, and it's loading the dice against us, it's making them worse. We see a record of a changing climate all around us. It doesn't have to be thermometers or satellites or ocean buoys. You can even measure it yourself. So this is a picture of a peach tree in Texas. You might be surprised, yes, there are peach trees in Texas. And my colleague, a guy who's a biology professor, he had a peach tree in his backyard that he planted when he first moved to Lubbock, Texas, which is where I live, over 30 years ago. 
being a biologist, he wrote down the date that that peach tree flowered every year until just a few years ago when he had to cut it down. When he had to cut down the peach tree, it was flowering on average two to three weeks earlier in the year than when he first planted it. That's a measure of a warming climate. If we add up all the different independent lines of evidence in nature, melting glaciers, rising sea level, insects, birds, and animals moving poleward, when certain trees and plants are flowering or where they can even grow, invasive species moving northward, there's over 26 and a half thousand independent lines of evidence just in nature alone telling us that yes, the planet really is warming. So when people say, is climate changing? How can it be changing? It's cold outside. It's like saying, you know, standing on the deck of the Titanic and saying, the ship can't be sinking because my end just went 200 feet up in the air. We know that we can have cold days, that's winter. We can even break cold uh, temperature records, that's weather. But we also know that over climate time scales, which is the average of at least 20 to 30 years, the planet continues to warm. So when people say, is climate changing? The answer is yes, it is. But then people might say, well, why is climate changing, right? Because we know that in the past, climate has changed for natural reasons, right? And it absolutely has. In fact, we climate scientists are the ones who study that. We know that in the past, climate has changed as the sun's energy has gone up and down. And we also know that there are natural cycles that also affect the Earth's temperature and our climate. So when we see climate changing, we can't automatically assume it's got to be humans. We have to look at the natural causes first, right? It's kind of like the elimination process. We have to say, could it be something we've already seen before? So let's do that together. Here's the temperature of the Earth. As I said, it goes up and down from year to year. That's just weather. But over climate time scales, which is the average of at least 20 to 30 years, it is definitely going up. Here's the energy from the sun now, ready? This is the energy from the sun. Now it goes up and down over 11 years. That's the 11 year sunspot cycle that was discovered by Galileo hundreds of years ago. But long term, the sun's energy has actually been going down. So if our temperature were being primarily controlled by the sun right now, we'd be getting cooler, not warmer. In fact, we should be getting a lot warmer than we are today, but the sun is helping us out. So it can't be the sun causing the warming. According to the sun, we should be getting cooler. What about natural cycles? Well, we have a lot of natural cycles inside the Earth's climate system. El Nino is one of the most famous natural cycles, but there's a lot of other ones too. And we know that these natural cycles act like a teeter-totter or a seesaw. In other words, what they do is they take heat and they move it around the climate system. These natural cycles move heat from north to south, east to west, and most often from the ocean to the atmosphere and back again. So if one part of the climate system, like the atmosphere, is getting warmer due to a natural cycle, that heat has to be coming from somewhere else, right? Because otherwise, you probably learned in science class already, that violates the conservation of energy. In other words, energy can't be created out of nothing. Energy has to be created by something. So you can't just have random energy appearing and heating the planet. That energy has to be coming from somewhere. And if the air, the atmosphere, is heating up due to a natural cycle like El Nino, that heat would have to be coming from the ocean. So instead of looking just at air temperature, which is all we've been looking at so far, Let's look at the change in the heat content of the ocean and the atmosphere. Because if the heat content of the atmosphere is going up, but the heat content of the ocean is going down by the same amount, then we know that the atmosphere is getting warmer because it's a natural cycle. So is this what we see? No, this is not what we see. In fact, we see exactly the opposite. So the green line here, and by the way, the, this data in, in heat, it's measured in joules. Joules is a form of energy measurement, right? And this is actually zeta joules, isn't that crazy? <laughs> so 
The green is the extra amount of heat that has been building up in the atmosphere and the land surface and the ice or the cryosphere since the 1960s. But the ocean is not the same amount, but in an opposite direction. The ocean is even more. In fact, 20 times more heat is being absorbed by the ocean. So it isn't a natural cycle. The entire planet is warming. But there is a second type of natural cycle. And the second type of natural cycle changes the amount of energy from the sun that we absorb. So this natural cycle is actually responsible for the ice ages. It was discovered by a man called Milankovic, who during World War I, he was a concrete engineer, but he was Serbian. And so he was not allowed to work on concrete engineering because if you remember history class, during World War I, they were using a lot of concrete to build those, um, those trenches that they used during, during the warfare. They'd build these big long trenches and that's where the soldiers would hide. And they used a lot of concrete in building those trenches. So because Milankovic was kind of on the wrong side of the war, he was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but he was a Serb, so he was on the wrong side. They didn't want him working on concrete engineering. So during World War I, they said to him, you can stay at the university, we won't put you in prison, but you have to study something that has nothing related to warfare. So he said, okay, I'll study the Ice Ages. That has nothing to do with warfare, and it doesn't. And because he had that time to study, he discovered that the reason why we have ice ages is because the shape of the Earth's orbit changes over time. It becomes more circular and then more elliptical. And then also the axis of the Earth's rotation precesses like a top. Now, you know, when you spin a top, it spins around really quickly and the Earth spins around really quickly too, once every day. But you also know that that top rotates around slowly. That's called precession and that's what the Earth does too. That changes how energy hits the Earth. And so people might say, well, aren't we just getting warmer after the last ice age? Because we know we had an ice age a while back. Aren't we just getting warmer? Well, when you look at the data and when you look at where we are in these cycles, it turns out that the next event on our orbital calendar was not more warming. It was another ice age because the last ice age warming peaked about six to 8,000 years ago. So after the last ice age, we got warm really fast and then it peaked and then it started to slide downhill because according to orbital cycles, we should be heading into another ice age sometime, don't get worried, sometime in about the next 1500 years. So not our lifetime, but still on geologic timescales, that's pretty soon. Used to be another ice age though, because now things are changing rapidly. So it can't be the sun because we'd be getting cooler. It can't be a natural cycle like El Nino because the whole planet is warming, not just the atmosphere. And it can't be the Earth's orbit because according to that, the next thing was another ice age. So if you'd like to hear this all again with some cute cartoons, I have a series called Global Weirding that is on YouTube. There's about 35 short videos, about six or seven minutes each, and the video on this is just a natural cycle, isn't it? This video talks about everything that I just talked about here. So if you feel like you want to listen to that again or you want to share this with somebody, check out the YouTube Global Weirding video on natural cycles. But the reality is, is that we have known that the planet had a natural blanket that keeps us over 60 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than we should be otherwise. We have known that since the work of a guy called Joseph Fourier in the 1820s. And since the work of John Tyndale and Eunice Foote in the 1850s, we have known that digging up and burning coal, and then later we learned gas and oil also, is producing more of these heat trapping gases, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. Eunice, I don't have a real photo of her, so this is just our cartoon, Eunice even speculated in 1856 that if carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere were higher at some time in the future or the past, that our Earth would be warmer. And she was absolutely right. And then this guy over on the right hand side called Arrhenius, he even calculated in the 1890s using nothing more than the science they knew at that time, how much the world would warm if we doubled or tripled levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then this last person, his name is Guy, Guy Callender rode around the world, collected temperature observations from weather stations around the world, and actually measured the warming of the planet for the first time 
because of all this extra heat trapping gases that we were producing when we dug up and burned coal and gas and oil. That is how long we've known about climate change. So ever since the Industrial Revolution, we have been digging up and burning fossil fuels that have powered our society and they brought us a lot of benefits. But we know that when we burn them, it produces carbon dioxide. And we know that's a very powerful heat trapping gas. As it builds up in the atmosphere, it's wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. And just like a blanket keeps you warm on a cold night, but too many blankets make you sweat, in the same way, we're wrapping an extra blanket around our planet that it does not need. And that is why our planet is running a fever. So why is climate changing? Science says it's got to be the fact that we're wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. Every other natural cause has an alibi. But people say it's just a natural cycle, though, or we haven't studied this long enough to be sure we have 150 years. You scientists are making the whole thing up. Temperature or sea level isn't going up, it's going down. It's such a tiny amount of CO2 or it's cold outside. We've already talked about many of these objections. But often when you see headlines like, you know, former NASA scientists dispute climate change, the real headline actually needs to be NASA retirees who have no climate expertise try to debunk NASA scientists who do. Or when people say, global temperatures plunge, icy silence from climate alarmists. Look at the date. The date of this article is November 30. What happens in November every year? winter. So it's crazy how people mix this stuff up. And then, of course, my favorite is when people say it's just such a tiny amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 400 parts per million. That's tiny. Well, it's just a tiny bit of white powder that I put in someone's glass. Oh, sure, it might be arsenic, but it's just a tiny amount. Now, more seriously, just think about when you're sick. When you're sick, does the doctor give you a pill to take that's the size of your body? No, of course not. When you take vitamins, do you have to take a vitamin that's like the size of your head? No. Why? Because the potency matters. If something is very strong, you can have only a little bit of it, right? And it still makes a big difference. One argument people often bring up is, it's been a lot warmer before. Like during the medieval warm period when they called Greenland, Greenland, it never was green, it was still covered in an ice sheet, but they called it Greenland, maybe to try to get people to move there or something. Those Vikings, you know, drinking uh, tropical drinks on the, on the deck of their ship. What did the medieval warm period actually look like? The medieval warm period was a classic example of a natural cycle because it was very warm over the North Atlantic, which is where stories of the medieval warm period come from, from the Viking culture and from Western Europe. But if you lived in Siberia, where it was blue, blue means colder than average. If you lived in Siberia, it was not the medieval warm period. It was the medieval cold period. This was a natural cycle because what was happening here? The heat was being moved around from east to west. One place was warmer and another place was cooler, just like a teeter totter or a seesaw. What does it look like today on the exact same temperature scale? Ready? Don't blink. Very different. Today, the entire planet is warming over climate timescales. So to say that climate science isn't true is to say that the basic science that we use to explain why our fridges cool food, why our stoves heat food, and why airplanes fly isn't true. It's the same physics. That's how we know that climate is really changing and humans really are responsible. Now, if you want more information on all the different arguments people use to try to say the science isn't real, this is a fantastic website, skepticalscience.com. It has an article on almost any argument you might have heard. But we're going to move on now because I want to ask an even more important question. And this question is, why does this matter? What does it mean for us? Because often when we talk about climate change or when we see a book or a movie about climate change, whoops, I thought I had a picture there, but I didn't. 
often when we see a movie or you know a book about climate change it has a picture of a polar bear on it and we often think well you know sure i would like to save the polar bears that that doesn't have anything to do with me with my life the reality of course is as we talked about at the beginning yes the polar bears are affected but we are too we care about a changing climate because it changes the conditions that we have built our agriculture, our buildings, our energy system on, pretty much every aspect of our society is built on the idea that climate is stable. And even worse, we care about a changing climate because it loads the dice against us, right? It takes those naturally occurring weather and climate events and it's supersizing them, making them more frequent or more severe in many cases. This was a headline from just last week. Wildfires, hurricanes, and other extreme weather cost the nation 247 lives, nearly 100 billion in damages during 2018 alone, and experts say that climate change might already be fueling an increase in these. What type of changes are we seeing? Well, if we look over the past decades, of course, not a single year, we have to look over climate timescales, we see that heavy rainfall is getting a lot more intense and more frequent. In fact, if you look at a map, of how it's been changing, you can see that there's been really big increases, especially if you live in the Northeast and the Midwest. Why? Because warmer air holds more water vapor. So when a storm comes along, as it always does naturally, there's more water vapor sitting up there in the air for that storm to sweep up and dump on us today than there was 50 or 100 years ago. What else are we seeing? We're seeing that heat waves are getting more frequent and cold waves, we still have them, we know that, but cold waves are getting less frequent. And that just makes sense because the hotter it is, the more you see heat waves too. So for example, this is a map of the average number of days per year that we've seen over 100 degrees from the 1960s to the 1990s, not a lot. And then we had the summer of 2011. If you lived in any of these places, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Arizona, Southern California, it was a crazy summer with weeks and in some places even months worth of days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It was a record breaking summer. But what worried me the most when I looked at this map is because I had created a map a few years earlier, before 2011, that looked almost exactly the same. But this was a map of what the average summer would look like by the middle of the century, which is now actually less than 40 years away, more like 30 years. If you look at the numbers on this map, they're almost the same as the crazy record-breaking summer we saw in 2011. So imagine if a record-breaking heat wave summer became the average summer. That's why we care. We also know that droughts are getting stronger across the south central United States and the southwest, and forest fires are burning greater and greater area. We aren't seeing more frequent forest fires because most of them are due to human ignition. So the number of forest fires is pretty much stable. But what we are seeing is that we're seeing bigger and bigger ones. So for example, last December, the Thomas fire became the largest wildfire on record in California, but that record was broken seven months later, eight months later by the ranch fire. And then it was smashed a few months later by the campfire. So we're seeing more and more fires burning greater and greater area. And what we actually found is across all the Western states, if you add it all up, the area that's been burned by wildfires since the 1980s has approximately doubled as a result of a changing climate. It's those dice that are being loaded against us. So wildfire is a natural part of life if you live in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, Colorado, Utah. Wildfire is natural, but also Washington State and Oregon, as well as British Columbia, of course, too. Wildfire is natural, but climate change is loading the dice against us, making it burn larger and larger areas, the hotter and the drier it gets. And then we can't forget hurricanes. Now, we are not actually seeing more frequent hurricanes. Hurricanes are not getting more frequent. Sometimes we have bad years like 2017, sometimes we have not so bad years like 2018. But hurricanes and cyclones and typhoons, they're called different names depending on where they happen in the world, but it's all the same type of storm. They get their energy from the warm ocean water. And do you remember, we were just talking about the fact that 20 times more heat is going into the ocean 
then into the land, the atmosphere, and the ice all put together. Remember when we were talking about natural cycles, we saw that figure about heat content? What does that together? Remember when we were talking about natural cycles, we saw that figure about heat content? What does all that heat do? It can power stronger storms. So hurricanes are not getting more frequent, but they have a lot more rainfall associated with them because warmer air holds more water vapor. They're also getting stronger faster, which makes sense because there's more energy available to them in the ocean. So we're not seeing a change in the number, but of the hurricanes that happen, more of them are stronger. They're moving more slowly, which is bad because they can sit over you for longer and dump a lot more rainfall. They're also getting bigger, no surprise. They're starting to move northward because warmer water is, is moving northward, so hurricanes can make it further up the coast, all the way to Halifax or even Ireland. And sea level is rising too, which means storm surges are getting worse. So for Harvey, which caused over $120 billion worth of damage in 2017 alone, we know now that if the same storm had happened 100 years ago, which it could have, right? Because hurricanes are natural it would have had about 40% less rain associated with it. The damages would have been a lot less. We also know that rising sea levels are not just making storm surges associated with hurricanes worse. This is a, a figure showing how sea level is changing around the world over the last 100 years. We also know that it's increasing the risk of sunny day flooding. So in other words, flooding when there's no storm, it's just a king tide over sea level rise. So a new federal report just last year found that high tide flooding could happen every other day in many coastal cities by late this century. And we already know today that the, increase, that the risk of this type of high tide flooding has already increased by a factor of 10 for many towns along the eastern coast of the United States. So it doesn't even have to have a storm. Just sea level rise plus high tide equals flooding now in many places. So if you want to know more about how climate change affects the places where you live, we have a global weirding episode for every region of the United States. We have one for Alaska, the islands in the Caribbean and the Pacific, the Southwest, the Northwest, the Midwest, the Great Plains, um, the Southeast, the Northeast, and we have one for Canada that's going to be coming out next. So if you want to know more about what climate change means in the place where you live, check out the Global Weirding episode, and this is a picture of our page on YouTube, check out the Global Weirding episode that talks about your region. There'll be a lot more information that matters directly to you. But the bottom line, though, is that climate change affects us all over the world. If we live in India or Southeast Asia, if we live in Bangladesh or Florida, no matter where we live, we are being impacted by a changing climate. A year ago, last September, a third of the country of Bangladesh was underwater due to really incredible flooding. But we've also seen incredible flooding here in North America. We've seen severe droughts in Texas recently that are a lot worse because it's been hotter, but they've also seen severe droughts in Syria, which are two to three times more likely, they've calculated, as a result of a changing climate. Whether we live in Alaska or on the coast, whether we live in Australia or India, we are all being affected by a changing climate, every single one of us. So to care about a changing climate, we just have to be a human living on this planet. But we also need to recognize that people who don't have the benefits and the resources we do, those are the people who are suffering the most. So the number one reason why I care about a changing climate is because it affects people who are already poor and hungry and don't have enough food to eat or people who are dying from diseases that nobody should die from in 2019 or they don't have access to clean water or they don't have a safe place to live those people are the most vulnerable people so while we are being affected in the places where we live there is no question about that other people are being affected even more and that's why we care even more because it just isn't fair Climate change is loading the dice against us. So here's my last question. The last question is this. Well, what can we do about this, right? Because this is a huge problem. And I'm just one person and there's seven and a half billion people on the planet, right? 
what can we do about it? Well, the, pre the former president science advisor, um, John Holdren, he said something really smart. He said, at this point, we have three choices. We can reduce our carbon emissions that are wrapping an extra blanket around the planet, and that's what's causing the planet to warm. We can adapt or we can prepare for a very different future, and we have to do that too, or we can suffer. And we're going to do some of each. The only question is what the mix will be, because the more and the faster we cut our carbon emissions, the less we're going to have to adapt to and the less suffering there's going to be. So what's the most important thing that you can do about it? Talk about it. If you want to know more about talking about it, I have a TED Talk that just came out a couple of weeks ago. If you just look for my name and TED, I have a TED Talk about talking about it that explains more about how we can do this. Why is it so important? Because hardly anybody does talk about it. 75% of people in the United States don't even hear somebody else talk about it more than once or twice a year. So here's why this matters. If we don't talk about it, why would we care? If we don't care, why would we ever want to do anything about it? It starts with a conversation, but hopefully a conversation that continues to action. Now, you may be thinking, well, what can I do about this? Well, the first thing we can all do, no matter whether we live in, in Texas or Asia, is say, sure, this thing is real. It actually matters. But then there's all kinds of solutions we can talk about. Now, as an adult, I like talking about, you know, my electric car and I replace the light bulbs in our house. And we it's important for us to eat lower down the food chain because the more beef and pork we eat, the more carbon emissions that produces because beef and methane, beef and, and pork take up a lot of heat trapping gases to produce compared to things like fish or vegetables. But my favorite global weirding video that we made out of all of them is this one. I'm just one kid. What can I do? So if you want to check out some amazing stories of what kids are doing to help fix climate change, please watch this video because it is amazing. And in fact, I have to say that kids are putting the adults to shame. This is what we can talk about. We can talk about these stories of people who are doing incredible things or choices that we can make that make the world a better place rather than worse or save us money or are smart. I love talking about what different communities are doing, universities putting solar panels on the roof of their um, basketball arena or churches putting them on the roof of their church. Or um, in Minnesota, for example, there's an organization that puts pollinator friendly plants to help bees in solar farm fields. That's pretty cool, why not? Did you know that two of the richest companies in the world, Walmart is number one and 11, I, Apple I think is number 11 right now, they are going, in the case of Walmart, 50%. In the case of Apple, 100% clean energy. That's something pretty cool that we can talk about, right? I love talking about what's happening around the world. Did you know that Morocco has the biggest solar farm in the world? In Morocco. The United Kingdom has the biggest offshore wind farm in the world. And this is really interesting. Did you know that China has more wind and solar energy than any other country in the world? They even have a panda-shaped solar farm. Now, Walt Disney also has a Mickey Mouse shaped polar, or solar farm too. I love talking though about what's happening in places where people don't have energy, where people are most vulnerable to the impacts of a changing climate. And I love the fact that although these countries, they might not have a lot of oil or coal or gas, they do have a lot of sun and they have a lot of wind. And so the fact that these new forms of clean energy are helping them to electrify their homes where they've never had electricity before, that is really amazing. And I love talking about that. So the bottom line is, remember, we're driving up this road. The road is no longer straight. There is a big curve in the road, and the curve is climate change. What do we want to do? We don't want to say, oh, no, that curve's not there, because we're going to drive off the road. We want to say, yes, climate is changing. And we have to make sure that we are prepared to make it around that curve together because we're all in the same giant bus. The bottom line is this. Climate change is scary. I think about that a lot. But we can fix it. And to fix it, we need hope. And to have hope, we need to do what one of my favorite scientists, Jane Goodall, told us. She said it isn't just about our clever brain. It isn't just about being smart and knowing a lot of data and facts and information. It's about connecting our brain to our heart so that we can work together in harmony to achieve our full potential. Thank you.
All right. So I see some questions here in the window that I'm going to answer. If anybody else has any questions, please go ahead. I think we have another 10 minutes or so, don't we? All right. Um, Kenyon asked, on average, how much is temperature going up? Is there a point of no return? Um, temperature has gone up about one degree Celsius or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit in the last 100 years. Over the coming century, we could see anywhere from probably about two degrees Celsius up to as much as five degrees Celsius or 10 degrees Fahrenheit or more if we continue on our current pathway. What's the biggest uncertainty in terms of how much climate change we're going to see the next century? Us. We are the ones who determine how much climate is going to change by how much heat trapping gases we produce and how thick that extra blanket gets that we're wrapping around the planet. So that's why it's so important to talk about it so that people care about it so that we understand we need to fix it. Because if we don't do anything, we're going to see a massive amount of change that we're not going to be able to adapt to and it's going to cause a lot of suffering. People say, well, can we turn the clock back on this thing? That's going to be pretty hard. There are ways that people already have to suck those heat trapping gases back out of the atmosphere and turn them into things like stone and even fuel, which is really useful. But right now, those methods are very expensive. So the first thing we need to do is stop putting so much up there. And then the second thing we can do is start sucking it back down, putting it into the soil, which is really good for the soil, turning it into products we can use like stone and building blocks and other fuel. But for now, the most important thing to do is stop producing so much. All right. Um, what do you say to people who say that global warming is fake? That is a great question. I get those people every day. So I'm on Twitter and Facebook. Um, I'm on Instagram too, but people are very nice on Instagram. They don't normally say things like that on Instagram. But on Twitter, they say it a lot. I get people every single day saying, you know nothing, it's fake, it's not real. But when you have a conversation with those people, now if they're really rude, I usually don't. But if we have a conversation within just about 30 seconds, the conversation goes from the science isn't real to, I don't want the government to tell me what type of car or truck I can or can't drive, set my thermostat, destroy the economy, let China get ahead. Well, China's actually already ahead in clean energy, but a lot of people don't know that. It's all political. And so arguing facts with people is often not what's going to fix the problem. Rather, it's important to talk about solutions that they can get on board with, solutions that don't involve destroying the economy, because who wants that? Solutions that actually build up the economy. The fact that here in Texas, we already have 30,000 jobs in the wind and solar energy industry, and that's a lot. So in my TED talk, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to share my screen with you one more time so I can show you what the TED talk looks like. I didn't want to give you the exact same TED talk because I figured, you know, you can watch it yourself. Let's see if I can start screen sharing again and monitor. Okay. So here we go. I'm going to share my screen with you one more time. And this is my TED talk that I encourage you to watch that talks about how do we actually have a conversation with people about a changing climate when they aren't necessarily on board with it, the science. And the answer is not by arguing the science, but rather by talking about solutions that they can agree with. So just making sure that you guys can see the screen here. Um, this is the TED Talk. The most important thing you can do to fight climate change is talk about it. And I specifically talk about how you would actually talk about it. All right. Where are we here? Okay, let's see. Um, what do you think is going to happen in 12 years if we don't do anything? Okay, this is a great question because we hear people throwing the 12 years around a lot, but 12 years doesn't come from scientists. It doesn't. We know as scientists that every additional gigaton of carbon we produce creates more change. And so when should we cut our carbon emissions? As soon as possible, by how much? as much as possible and eventually all the way to zero. Now it's true if we continue on our current pathway, you know, within a certain amount of years, we'll have produced a certain amount of carbon that will lead to at least a certain amount of warming. So that's where people get these numbers from. But these numbers, I think, create this false impression like there's some type of magic threshold. Like if we, you know, do everything we can up to 12 years, we'll be fine. But if we get to January 1st on year 13, everything's terrible. That's not true at all. 
the reality is every single year that goes by without doing anything, we're going to see an extra amount of change that causes an extra amount of damages. So what can we do? Cut our carbon. How quickly? As soon as possible. How much? Eventually all the way to zero. And then in the future, and this is answers another question too, in the future, we need to start sucking that carbon back out of the atmosphere because that is the only way that we can actually reverse some of the impacts that we've had on our planet. What is America doing currently to combat global warming? Actually a lot. Now at the federal level, not much. And, and I think we all know that, but individually cities, states, regions, universities, colleges, seminaries, um, Native American tribes, businesses, industry, they're doing a lot. Over 40% of the United States, in terms of their carbon emissions, over 40% of the United States is still in on the Paris Agreement. There are entire cities, we have one right here in Texas called Georgetown, that have gone 100% clean energy. I was just in Dallas, and Dallas has gone 100% clean energy. Dallas, Texas, isn't that amazing? DFW Airport is the first carbon neutral airport in the United States. Walmart, again, the biggest company in the world based in the United States is going to be 50% clean energy by 2025 and Apple's already 100%. So incredible things are happening and it's important to learn about these and share them and talk about them, right? Because this is what matters. This shows us that we really can fix it and we're not alone. There are millions of us in the United States alone already working to fix this problem. The boulder is not sitting at the bottom of the hill and we have to try to roll it up the hill. The boulder is already at the top of the hill and it's rolling very gradually down, but we just need more hands to push that boulder down faster. That's the situation that we're in today. Okay, let me check out a couple more of your questions here. Um, Josh asks, what's the best thing students can do to help stop climate change? I have addressed that. Um, and if you, if you want more, watch the TED Talk and watch the Global Weirding episode of I'm Just One Kid, What Can I Do? Uh, let's see. In the diagram about the Earth's orbit changing, is the orbit around the sun enlarging or shifting? So our orbit around the sun has a natural cycle where it gets more circular and then more elliptical and then more circular and then more elliptical. It isn't getting bigger. It isn't getting smaller. It just changes shape. And the fact that it changes shape changes how much sunlight falls on the Earth, when and where. And that's part of what contributes to the ice ages. But again, right now, we should be heading into another ice age, not getting warmer faster and faster. All right, let's see. Um, what uh, do you think America is doing enough to assist with global warming? No. The United States is the only country that has announced that it does not want to be part of the Paris Agreement that every other country in the entire world is part of to try to limit the warming that we see this century to below two degrees Celsius or three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. The United States is not doing enough at the federal level at all. Now, individual cities and states absolutely are, as we just talked about, but at the federal level, they are not. And the reason they're not is because there aren't enough people voting to say, hey, calling up their congressperson or their senator and saying, hey, I care about climate change and we need to fix it. So it really is a case of people don't think it matters to them. People might say, sure, the science is real, but it doesn't matter to me. That's why talking about the impacts is also so important. So the two most important things to talk about are the impacts and the solutions. It isn't just about the polar bear, it's about how it's affecting us. And second of all, there are things that we can do to fix it. It's really important to do that. Um, is anyone making clean energy more affordable? They absolutely are. In fact, in Texas, wind and solar energy is cheaper than natural gas many times of the year already. So there's lots of people working on that. And if you're interested in working on clean energy, or if you're interested in working how to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, then what you want to do is you want to become an engineer. That is the field, not a scientist. You want to become an engineer because that's the field where you can help with that specifically. Um, Kathy asks, how does animal agriculture and factory farming affect global warming? So about three quarters of this extra blanket that we're wrapping around our planet comes from digging up and burning coal and gas and oil. About a quarter of it comes from agriculture and land use. So deforestation, burning trees, and growing large number of animals, especially animals like cows and pigs and sheep that produce a lot of methane. Methane is a very powerful heat trapping gas. 
Carbon dioxide produces most of this blanket. So about 65% of this blanket is carbon dioxide and about 18% 18 of it is methane. And then there's some other gases too. So if you look at animal agriculture all around the world, it is responsible for total about 14% of this extra blanket. Now, the most important thing we can do is figure out ways to get energy that don't depend on fossil fuels. But as individuals, one of the most important things we can do as individuals is reduce our food waste because we throw out about a third of the food that we produce. We don't even eat it. So reducing food waste is a huge and important thing we can do. And then eating lower down the food chain is also a really important thing we can do because the less beef and pork we eat, the less carbon footprint we have associated with our food. All right. Let's see. I think we had a couple more questions here. Um, there is a question about, uh, let's see. Um, Will natural gases ever take over the atmosphere to the point where we're breathing in bad gases? Um, so most of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen and oxygen. That's most of what we breathe. And carbon dioxide is only a tiny part of it. So in other words, if, if you had a million uh, particles of gas, then only 400 of those would be carbon dioxide. But we do know that as carbon dioxide levels increase, not the way they are today, but if they got up to you know, 600, 800, or 1,000 parts per million instead of 400, at that point, they've done experiments to show that that actually affects our brain function. Our brains don't work as well when we're not getting enough oxygen. And if carbon dioxide levels got way higher than today, not where they are today, today we're okay. But if they got way higher than today, they have done some experiments that show that that could affect our ability to think, which is really scary. So there's lots of reasons to cut these heat trapping gas emissions. Number, reason number one is climate change. The reason number two is because if it keeps on going for a long time, it will actually start to affect our health directly as well. All right. Um, question from Melissa. If we rapidly change our energy sources, do you think that would lead to drastic changes in the standard of living in different regions of the world? Um, there's about a billion people in the world who don't have access to any energy other than maybe very expensive kerosene. Billion people. Why don't they have access to the energy that we have? So why are those countries so poor? It's because they don't have coal or gas or oil. And they can't afford to buy it from richer company, or companies, <laughs> richer countries like us. So interestingly, people often say, oh, you know, poor people need, poor countries need fossil fuels to develop like we did. And that's such a common myth that we even have a global weirding episode about it. So if you're interested in more, check out our global weirding episode on don't poor people need fossil fuels, because the answer is they don't even have them to begin with. And that is exactly why they're poor. But they do have wind and sun. And so some of my favorite organizations are ones that are going into poor countries and that are actually helping people use new clean ways of getting energy that don't pollute their air or their water. Did you know that over 4 million people die around the world from air pollution from burning fossil fuels alone? They also give them clean cook stoves. So instead of having to cut down and burn wood inside the house, which, which leads to I think something like two and a half to three million deaths per year from air pollution from burning wood inside the house, clean cook stoves that can be powered by natural gas or they can be solar cook stoves too, that people can use to cook food without cutting down trees and without dying from air pollution. So, we can't pull the plug today. There's no magic switch where we can turn everything off today because that would lead to much more suffering. It would return every country in the world to the conditions that we lived in, you know, three or 400 years ago. We can't do that, but we can help people who don't currently have access to free or cheap energy. We can help people like that get energy in clean ways that help them continue to grow and develop while at the same time taking ourselves, weaning ourselves, transitioning ourselves off old dirty ways of getting energy as soon as possible too. Because if we don't do that, we are gonna be affected by climate change. And really what's at risk is not the planet. It's not about saving the planet, it's about saving ourselves. All right, uh, I think that we've reached the end. Donna had a question about cl cloud seeding. Donna, you wanna watch the global reading episode on geoengineering. We have a little short global reading episode that talks about cloud seeding and geoengineering. I have loved chatting with you guys. You have such great questions. Thank you so much. I will, this is recorded, so it will be available online. 
And also please do check out our global reading episodes because as you can see, they answer a lot of the questions that you have. Thank you so much.